Appreciate you uh, being here very much. Coming back tonight. Uh, let me take care of a couple of housekeeping duties here. Um, one of the things that um, happens when a church is doing well and growing and prospering is that you have lots of stuff going on. And we've got lots of stuff going on. And if you checked the inside of the bulletin on page three at the bottom of the page, you notice the please note section. And we had our grief meeting this afternoon. We got the Valentine banquet coming up on the 10th. Remember that is this today's the last day to sign up for that because the supplies have to be purchased. The people who are going to take care of the prime rib, can you believe that? And the chicken have to know how much of that to get, how much to prepare. And although it's free, absolutely free, uh, you still need to sign the list tonight. So if you're planning to come on the 10th, go back in the foyer, turn right down the hall, and you'll find the list there. And put your name on it and uh, enjoy it. I have it on relatively good authority that we're having a special speaker this year. Uh, they, have they have spared no expense. The elders have spared no expense in getting this speaker to come in. Figure it out. <laughs> then the next Sunday... We're going to be having the elders and deacons meeting at 445. That's important where we all get together and talk about things relative to the church. So that's an important meeting. And then on the 17th, we're having our lift giveaway. We missed last month because of the very bad weather. And uh, this month, we don't want to miss... And whether we have it outside or inside, I don't know. That's a call that somebody else will make. But we'll have it. And hope that you'll be here to participate in that. And then I've asked for us to have a teacher's meeting on the 18th. Now, I know. We've got something going on every week. Yes, we do. And I'm sorry. I can't fix that. If we're going to do what we ought to do and grow and prosper, we need to have stuff. We need to have meetings. And the purpose of that meeting is to make sure that we're set for the next quarter, which begins in March. Our new quarter begins in March. And so if you're teaching, if you want to teach, if you want to help, we've got people this time that are helping in a class that have never helped in a class before. They just said, I'll do something. I'll do whatever. I'll help in the class. So if you're there, then you let us know, and we'll plug you in somewhere if it's at all possible. And so those of you who are the coordinators, I'm serving notice. Please start working on getting your group together so that we can have that published. And then the next weekend is CYC, and that list is already full uh, because of the accommodations that we have there. We can only take so many people. And so that list is already full. That means there's something going on every weekend in addition to services here. So that makes it busy. But that means the good things are happening, folks. That means good things are happening. So please keep all of that in mind, if you will. And I would appreciate it very, very much. We'll turn to Ephesians 2, if you will. And we will pick up our study. We are studying on Sunday night through Ephesians. I appreciate some of the things that have been said recently, not only about the Sunday morning sermons, but the Sunday evening sermons. We're diving a little deeper into the Word than we might normally dive and that's because our theme this year is roots and fruit. Remember that we put down the roots deep into the scripture and we take the things that we get there to help us bear fruit for his glory. I want to remind you of some things by way of introduction. 
I want to remind you how chapter 1 ended. Chapter 1 ended by talking about the power of God. And three things were given that demonstrated the power of God. First of all, it raised Jesus from the dead. That's power. To get a man out of the tomb who had been dead for three days and bring him to life again. We talked about the power of the exaltation. That's when Jesus was ascended back to heaven and where he presently is sitting at the right hand of God. That took power to take someone up from this earth to the very throne of God. And we talked about the power that made Jesus the head of the church. He is the absolute head of the body of the church. There is no other head. Contrary to what some say, there is not an earthly head and a heavenly head. There's only one head of the church, and that's Jesus. He calls the shots. It's his church. And so we're talking about power. What do you suppose we're going to talk about when we get into chapter 2? We're going to talk about power. And we're going to talk about the fact that the same power that did the things at the end of chapter 1 is the power that works in people today to help them move from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. How many times have you heard me say that we must remember that the Bible was not written in chapter and verse divisions? Paul didn't say, okay, I'm at the end of chapter 1, mark it, I'm going to start chapter 2. It was one continuous narrative. And so it's natural that as he talks about the great power of God that he says, and oh, by the way, that power is still available. Oh, by the way, that power is working in people today. And so chapter 2 is going to talk about people who were formerly dead in trespasses and sins, as we'll mention. And that those people were made alive in Christ. That's a pretty big transformation, isn't it? That you go from being dead to being alive, to being from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. Well, that's what we're going to find in the first 10 verses of Ephesians 2. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. Let's mention, first of all, in the first three verses, the condition of the people who were dead. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we were all once conducted, or we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as others. Dead, the basic definition, the working definition is it just means you're separated. If you're talking about physical death, it means we're separated from life. We're no longer alive. If we're talking about spiritual death, it means we're separated from God. You see, God is the one who makes us alive both physically and spiritually. If you want to talk about physical death or spiritual life or physical life, rather, read Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and God started speaking, and then He on the sixth day made man of the dust of the ground. God is the one who breathed into his nostrils. And he became a living soul. And so God is responsible for physical life. He's also responsible for spiritual life. Because here in verse 1 he says, And you he made alive. And if you trace the he back, it's God. So God is the source of life, whether we're talking about physical life or spiritual life. 
And so physical death is separation from the body. James talks about that. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead. James 1.26, so faith without works is dead also. And spiritual death means that we are separated eternally from God. I don't know, does that strike you as being an awful, awful thing? We talk about what's hell like. And we muse sometimes about whether the flames of hell are literal or figurative. Doesn't matter to me at all. I mean, that's just is something I don't want to be a part of, literal or figurative. We, we talk about the fact that it is a place of outer darkness, and we talk about is that literal or figurative, and it doesn't matter to me. I still get a little afraid in the dark sometimes when I don't know where I am and wonder what dangers are lurking. Here's what scares me about hell. Paul said it in 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, you can live your life with shaking your fist in the face of God if you want to. But you know what? You still live in his world. And you still enjoy the blessings that come from living in his world. Hell is the one place where God isn't. There's no trace, no presence, no glory, no power of God in eternal torment. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. That's terrible to be ever separated from the presence of the Lord. Now, these people were in that state. He says they were dead in what he calls trespasses and sins. Now, you know my passion for words. I've got to know what a word means so that I can understand the thought better. The word trespasses here is not a word that we use very often. It is pareptoma. Now, I don't think that's on the test to get into heaven or anything, but it's spelled out there for you in English on the slide if you're interested. And it means to fall by the wayside. And so trespasses means that just spiritually we fall away from the, on the, by the wayside. We're out of the path that leads to the right place. And we just fall along by the wayside. He said they were dead in trespasses and sins. Now we talked this morning about the word for sins that's translated here. It is, what do we say it was? You remember? Can you say it? Hamartia. Hamartia. And it means to miss the mark. So they were dead in that they were falling by the wayside and they had missed the mark. And so, of course, they were spiritually dead. There was no spiritual life in them. They were, in effect, walking dead men. That is, they still walked around physically. But inside, they were hollow. They were empty. Have you ever met people like that? I'm sad to say that I have. I've met people who were living, breathing creatures. But inside they were as empty and as dead as anything. There was no life in them. And that's what the situation was of these people who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, let me make the same, same comment tonight in effect that I made this morning. He's not talking about people who occasionally mess up. I want us to get that. Because sometimes when we sin, we feel terrible like there's no hope for us at all. But I want you to notice to which you once walked. 
walked according to the course of this world. Well, that means they progressed in it. That means that's what they did regularly and normally. They just didn't make a mistake. They walked in that kind of life. They continually lived that kind of life. And I want you to notice how he described that kind of life. Now, in the brief roof, I talked about alliteration. And alliteration is where you have terms that all begin with the same letter, and it's kind of a thing that helps us remember them sometimes. And I like to do that if it seems to be a natural thing to do. I don't like to manufacture them. But if it's pretty natural, I kind of like that. It's a memory device. They were depraved. They walked according to the course of this world. They, instead of being separate from the world, were a part of the world. You know what Paul said in Romans 12 too, don't you? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Now that's real easy for me to say. But how hard is it to stand up and say, the world says this, and I don't care. I'm not going to do it. This is popular. I don't care. I'm not going to do it. Everybody says you ought to. I don't care. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do what's right. I'm not going to let the world shape me. But these people had, and they were depraved. They were devilish. Did you notice that? It says that they were children of wrath. They followed Satan and not Christ. They were followers of the evil one, not the righteous one. And they were disobedient. They had rebelled against God. Now, you talk about being in a mess. If somebody stood up and said, rightfully so, you are depraved and devilish and disobedient, you wouldn't say, well, thanks for the compliment. You would understand that that's a terrible life to live. And that's the condition of those who were spiritually dead. And then he describes the awfulness of their condition in three other terms. And alliteration is used there too. First of all, they were carnal. You know what they thought about? The flesh. Boy, isn't that easy to do. Debbie Boone, bless her heart, years ago, at least I can remember that far back, had a hit song, How Can It Be Wrong When It Feels So Good? as if a thing feeling good determined whether it was right or wrong. Friends, it doesn't. There are lots of things that are wrong that feel real good fleshly. Now they do. If sin didn't feel good in some kind of a way, nobody would do it. We like the way it feels or we wouldn't do it. I enjoyed, I had a ball last night. Man, it was great. Were you carnal? Were you thinking about the flesh or the spirit? They were corrupt. Their lives were centered on disobedience, on sin. They weren't thinking about what was right. Didn't care about what was right. And they were condemned. They were not children of God. They were children of wrath, not children of God. And so here were people who were carnal and corrupt and condemned. And again, we wouldn't say, thanks for the compliment. We would understand that's a terrible way to be. So here we've got this awful condition of men who are dead in trespasses and sins. A people who are depraved and devilish and disobedient to people who are carnal and corrupt and condemned. 
Verse 4. Thank God for verse 4. But God. Now you just stop right there and you let that sink in. But God. Have you ever seen these before and after things? Yeah. You know, here he was, a 98 pound weakling, and everybody kicked sand in his face down at the beach. And now look at him. He's all rippled and got a six pack or maybe an eight or ten pack, I don't know. And he's just muscular and handsome and bronzed. And here's the before and here's the after. You know what's responsible for the before and the after here? But God. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. God is the very epitome of mercy and love and grace, and he intervened. He decided to do something because he didn't want us to stay in that spiritually dead condition. And so he intervened. Titus 2 and 11, but the grace of God has appeared to all men. If God hadn't done it, guess what? We'd still be in that mess. But he intervened. And Calvary demonstrates all of that. Hope you'll be here next Sunday. We've been talking about this salvation series. And the sermon next Sunday is the power. If we're going to talk about the power that is behind salvation, do you realize the power is in the blood? George, you're getting all of these down for the songs, aren't you? There's power in the blood. And God intervened and had his son pay the debt that he didn't owe for people who owed the debt and couldn't pay it. And that's what his blood's all about. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Now, let me just stop here and make a point. There are people, people, I think, waiting to become Christians by saying, whenever I get my act together, I'll do something. Whenever I make all the changes, whenever I start doing all of the stuff that I'm supposed to do and, and, and give up all the stuff that I'm not supposed to do, then I'll become a Christian. That's not the way it works. God never said, you get your act together and I'll save you. He said, let me help you get your act together and I'll save you. That's exactly what he said. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't wait till we got godly before he died. I love verse 4, but... God. And then in verses 5 through 10, can you guess what he's going to talk about? If he's talked in the first three verses about the dead man in the condition, if he says, but God, then what's he going to talk about in the last five verses? He's going to talk about, what about those who are alive? What's the condition there? Let me read it with you, please. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. People who were once dead became alive because of the power. The same power that raised up Christ from the dead that raised him up from this earth to heaven, that made him the head of the church, is the same power that changes us from dead men to living people. If I was in the Pentecostal church, somebody right there would have said, Amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Because that's one of those moments where we just ought to be so thankful for that very thing. I want you to notice a couple of things about this, the implications of the transformation. I want you to notice, first of all, in 6a, that they were raised and raised us up together. Hmm. Raised us. Now remember, the power that raised Jesus from the grave is the power that raises us. What's that have to do with I expect it has to do with baptism. You say, well, how in the world does baptism get in there? I knew you'd find a place for it if you could. Romans 6. He talks about what happens when we are baptized. That we are raised to walk in newness of life. Now, let me just stop and make a point here for people who just can't see any need for baptism. If we are raised from the waters of baptism to walk in newness of life, what are we before that? Now, you think about that. If it takes being raised from the waters of baptism to make us new people, what were we before that? We were old people, dead people, lost people, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. And then someday, you think about the fact that we'll be raised physically. Jesus in John 5 said that we'll be raised, that Jesus will raise us from the dead that that hour is coming when we all be raised. Some for the resurrection of life and some, unfortunately, from the resurrection of condemnation. But there is that wonderful thing that living people are people who are raised and they are glorified. They get to sit in 6B with Christ and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, every once in a while, one of these little kids up here will come up to me, and I've seen them do the same to other folks and say, can I sit with you? And I'm always glad to say, why, yes. Now, you've got to be good. You've got to pay attention. But you're welcome to sit with me. Do you realize that we can sit with Jesus? If that doesn't blow your mind, you, you know, something's wrong somewhere. That we have a, an opportunity to be glorified, raised up in the resurrection, to sit eternally with Christ in the heavenly places. I think that's just simply amazing. I think this is indicative of where all the spiritual blessings are. We learned in 
chapter 1 and verse 3, that he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And we get to sit with Christ in heavenly places. I think this is first seen in the church. But it certainly is also seen in that eternal home of the soul when Christ comes back to claim his own. Take us home with him. And then in verses 7 and 8, he says they are a display of his grace that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding mercies or the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Do you realize whenever we see a sinner saved, whenever we see a man who goes into the water a dead man and comes up a living man spiritually, we see a display of God's grace. That's nothing but a picture of God's amazing grace. We need to preach and believe grace. Not to the exclusion of faith, not to the exclusion of the good works that follow it, not to the exclusion of anything else that the New Testament requires of us. But we need to let people know that we are walking, absolutely walking displays of His grace. Some of you have commented about to me about liking some of the songs that you hear on one of the local stations that you listen to pretty regularly. And there's an old song. I remember that uh, George Yance, who was a great bass singer, would sing, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's all any of us are, people. That's all any of us are. We're just sinners saved by grace. We are trophies of his grace. And notice that in the ages to come, not only for right now, but in the ages to come, do you know what I do? I still am able, and I don't think this is the fulfillment of ages to come, but it's an example, that I'm able to look back at people that I had the opportunity to teach and see changed over the years. And I think 50 years later, 60 years later, that person is still a faithful Christian. They have a family. Their children are Christians, married Christians. They're raising their children. And I think they're still demonstrating the display of God's grace and what he's able to do in a soul. And he says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because I, I did that back in a sermon a week or so ago. But let me say just again to recap, though we're not saved by works of merit, not of works lest any man should boast, we are saved and expected to work. I think we need to teach some people that. Because they come up out of the water, new people, and sit down to not do very much. The word here is um, poema. I like some Greek words because you can almost see the English word we get from it. Can you... Uh, Guess what we get from poema? Uh, now, I grew up calling that a poem. A poem. And, and the word actually means a manufactured product. That means that God is making something through us. He is manufacturing a product in our lives. 
Titus 1, verse 14, But let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. If you want to read about works, read Titus. Of all places, Titus has a lot to say about works. Titus says, when your trophies of His grace, go out and act like it. Go out and help other people. Work, maintain good works. Well, let me give you the final word on these ten verses, which we've covered pretty quickly. I think we might call this section from Ephesians 2, verses 1 and following, a summary of God's great scheme of redemption or His great plan of salvation. Isn't that what it's about? Here we are, dead, trespasses and sins, but God intervened, and here we're living people, saved by grace to do good works. We can be changed from death to life. You don't know Warren Wearsby. Probably haven't read anything he's ever written. He is a denominational person, not a member of the Church of Christ. But I've always found uh, a lot of his writings to be very good. He wrote a whole series of commentaries called the B-series. And that's because they start out with be this, be that, be something else. And he, you know what he, he entitled this, this section? He said, get out of the graveyard. And I thought, yeah, there you go. That's a title if I ever heard one. Ephesians 2 is about getting out of the graveyard and coming to life.